There seems to be this kind of, as you describe, you know, <laughs> octopus of, uh, you know, some shared commonalities uh, uh, among these people. And I'm not, I'm not even talking about the Democratic Party specifically. Uh, uh, I'm talking, even though it seems to be kind of beholden to this, but, you know, all the people in this unelected uh, bureaucracy uh, and, and uh, I guess, some aspects of civil society. I think that's a good point. That's why I put those two chapters last, the unelected right juxtaposed to globalists. Just think what we saw in Afghanistan. It's almost a colonialist or neo-colonialist mentality. We had the U.S. military skedaddling in shame, but that very moment, and I'm talking over the, the final humiliating weeks in Afghanistan, we had the pride flag on the U.S. Embassy. We had George Floyd murals in Afghanistan in Kabul streets. And we had a huge gender studies program at the Kabul University. And so globalism is okay culturally because it promotes a particular view of uh, culture or radical democracy or equity, diversity and inclusion. And therefore you can impose those values on a traditional society like Afghanistan, even though the left says, that that would be culturally appropriating their culture or damning them or colonialism. So this leftist, this new version of this hardcore neo-socialist, neo-Marxism, it transcends all of the other political uh, stances that the left used to have. And you can really see what's happening when the Secretary of State, um, Mr. Blinken, tells us that he's invited the UN to come in and adjudicate whether we're racist or not at a time when say China has over a million and a half people in a, in, incarcerated in a labor camp, or we're supposed to join the Paris Climate Accord, even though our previous natural gas production and usage had ensured that we had fewer carbon emissions in the people, especially India and, Ch India and China that were in that group, or the multilateral Iran deal we had to to obtain the fee days of our allies, we had to sneak $400 million at night as a payoff, even though we knew they were violating. So the problem with all of this world government, and the Greeks started it when they started talking about the cosmopolitan, the city citizen of the world, is that it always is subject to the weakest link. And if you have 190 nations and over half of them are non-democratic, but you believe in democracy, as we do, then you have to say, well, even the non-democratic states get to vote. And therefore there's going to be a non-democratic either equality or maybe a, a, a partisan superiority in every consensus that applies to us. And I think, and then we, again, I don't want to dwell on it, but the, the elephant in the room of globalism is China. And China has, has brilliantly mastered the American mind. And the more that it talks about globalism, Notice that it also combines what you were talking about. It combines outrage about racism. So it'll say, uh, we, want a, we want an ecumenical community of nations, i.e. run by us in which we're exempt, and we can direct all of the envy and anger at the United States, and then we want to damn it for being the only multiracial democracy in the history of civilization that works, even though we're a very racist communist party. And yet people in the West seem to give China an exemption that they would never give for Russia, as we saw during the Russian collusion hoax. Well, and I think I think the critical part to note here is that China gives itself under the Communist Party the biggest exemption in all of this, while doing all of this that you describe. Yeah, absolutely. You can really see it on the left. That's why, as you, you know, I'm 68. And as you get older, I know that it's a tendency of human nature to get cynical. But when you look at the left today, it has very little to do with diversity, inclusion, and equity. It's all about uh, self, narcissism, and the retention, and I said the acquisition of power. Because if it were not, then these school deans and presidents are writing these memos about inclusion and all of this. They would be putting their kids in the public school, or they would be living in communities that were diverse, and they're not. Or if it were, if it were true, 
uh, they would not be going after minor presidents like John Tyler or somebody from our past and saying, we're going to take his picture down. Who cares about John Tyler because he's racist? They would be going after Che Guevara, who was a racist and a homophobe. And we know that because he said that and he wrote that. And yet they won't do that. They go after Mao the same way. So for them, it's a selective use of history to create a narrative that the United States is racist and pathological and somehow uh, we can apply the standards of the present to condemn the past to acquire <laughs> power in the future. So Victor, as you're just talking, I can't help but think about something that the Chinese Communist Party and the critical social just mo justice movement very much have in common, which is this idea, if you're not with me, if you don't accept my ideas or my position wholeheartedly in your heart, <laughs> then you're the enemy, then you're Hitler. You pose a kind of existential dilemma for me. And uh, this, is, this, is a, this is a huge question. I kept thinking that as I was reading. Yeah, I, I try to point out in The Dying Citizen, why is that? Why is the left uh, the party of the cancel culture? Or why does it, uh, as Barack Obama says, get in their faces or Maxine Waters, follow them everywhere? Why is it a 360 degree, 24 hours a day, lidless eye never sleeps? And I think they feel that like French revolutionaries under the Jacobins and during the reign of terror, that equity, equity is the most important thing. That even though we're born into the world as different people, some of us are going to have better inheritances, some none. Some of us are going to be healthy, some poor health our entire life. Some of us are going to be lucky, some unlucky, some slothful, some lazy, some brilliant, some stupid. But there's so many variables that most uh, political philosophers throughout history said, don't, don't try to outsmart human nature or God or the way the world works, but just just make a framework so you have an equality of opportunity and then make a social that encourages the wealthy and the winners to help the poor. But when you come in and you say equity, not equality, equity, that is equality of result or on the back end, then you say, I need all of this power to ensure that people are equal. So they all die at the same way they were born. And therefore, I'm going to be the architect of it. And I need this power. If I'm John Kerry, I need to go on a jet plane and with a high carbon emission rate to stop carbon emissions. And when I was a student, all we heard was any means necessary. And that was quoting Sartre or France uh, Fanon or even Malcolm X, any means necessary. And then it became the noble ends justify the means, however sorted. But the, the point was, I never thought I'd see those resurrected because they were so logically fallacious and nobody really thought you could run a society by justifying any type of behavior. But when I saw that clip of the other day of the harassment of Senator Cinema, and then you hear what people are doing, going to people's homes and sicking the FBI on legitimate criticism, you do get the impression that the left now feels that they have a superior morality and therefore they're not accountable in a symmetrical way. And by that I mean, if they destroy for 120 days, $2 billion in property, 28 people die, looting, arson, protests, torch two federal courthouses, that's not the same as a January 6th riot, which was deplorable on the side of the right. But there will be one, in one case, you don't dare put federal troops. That would be fascistic to store order in Washington when they try to burn down and deed towards the St. John's Episcopal Church. But you know what? Even though we're leftists, let's get 25,000 troops out there in the streets of Washington to monitor mythical mythical uh, white supremacy demonstrations that will follow, which of course none did. And so they, they do, that's what's scary because you can't argue. I think that's what you were saying. You can't argue with these people because it's almost a religious cult and they believe on faith, not empiricism. We are better than you because we believe in a radical equality of result. And therefore we have to have the power and the means to do anything to achieve it because you're guilty or you're white or you're selfish except or you're poorly educated or something. And history's full of these periods when these people take over, whether it's Stalin or Mao 
are, you know, and they're just as dangerous as the far right, and more dangerous because they, they are much more adept at government control. So two things I'm thinking. One is that um, anyone that's attracted to, uh, I guess, power uh, would definitely be attracted into this, into working in this structure. Right? So I, I can kind of imagine how, how, how that might work. The second thing I'm thinking is, you know, and I keep thinking this all the time, this is this higher uh, morality, so to speak. I think of Marcuse's repressive tolerance idea. Yeah, I mean, he was at least, of all of the Frankfurt School, he was the most honest in saying that we're not going to be, we're not going to be uh, symmetrical. We're not going to be even-handed. That we are going to decide what can be tolerated and what is not to be tolerated because we're revolutionaries and we start with the premise, the deductive premise, that we are morally superior and our goals are morally superior and they're not subject to audit or. Uh, empirical audit or censure. So once you have that attitude, then what do you stop at? Mao's 60 million dead, Stalin's 20 million dead, Pol Pot's 3 million dead. You stop, you, Donald Trump said if they start tearing down statues at night without a vote of the city council, they won't just stop with Confederate mediocrities. They'll go on to Jefferson or Frederick Douglass or Lincoln, and he did exactly that. And now we're we're in fear of them, and nobody I think will ever put up a statue as long as they're around because they know they'll tear it down for whatever particular moral excuse that they provide. It, it's almost Orwellian, you know. And I mentioned in the book that one day I went to during the lockdown to my office at the Hoover Institution. I looked down at Junipero Serra Plaza, and it was named after that great Catholic missionary of the late 18th century that founded the California mission system and introduced a lot of agriculture and settled development. I mean, he was a man of his time, so he's now ridiculed for trying to bring in an alien, i.e. alien uh, religion to indigenous people, et cetera, et cetera. But the next day, next time I came back, I said, where's the, where's the street, the plaza? The name had been taken off. And I don't know what happened, but it was almost as if you were in the 1930s with Trotsky and all of a sudden his name disappears. So they're renamed, and then I, I've noticed that one day I wrote Bolt Hall in a column, the guy said, it doesn't exist anymore. And then I thought, wow. And the Wilson School of Diplomacy at Princeton no longer exists. So insidiously, as you and I talk, these sleepless people are constantly recalibrating us into a year zero mentality, 1619, not, not 1776 or 1783. We're not going to have any more names named that the San Francisco City Council is renaming schools. And it, it's how do you fight that when these people are absorbed with it and they have the, the support of all of our institution? I mean, I'm not trying to be alarmist, but when you when you have the CEO of Delta, the CEO of American Airlines, respectively from Georgia and Texas, and they tell the country that providing an aid, an ID at an election under these new, they're not new, but just recalibrated election laws is racist. And you think, wait a minute, to get to your airline, I've got to have an ID to get through security or you won't let me fly. And I just called up the Delta helpline. It was six hours of waiting. Don't you have more worry about that? Or in the case of America, in the last two flights I had taken at the time when he said that, we headed in the opposite direction to find fuel because there was no fuel at the airport to give us enough uh, enough aviation gas to get to our destination. I thought, these are, these are strange things and they tell you why systems like communist China and under Mao or the Stalinist Russia failed because they had these commissars everywhere and people were so scared of the person over their shoulder, they were virtue signaling all the time and they weren't doing their job and they weren't accountable. Nobody in the left said, thank you, American Airlines. You got everybody safely again today on time with fuel. Thank you, Delta Airlines. You have a very efficient uh, online and uh, phone uh, service for people to change their flight when they're canceled. Instead, they say, oh my God, they didn't say anything about the new voter law. And that's what they're afraid of. We're living in the era of intimidation.